What's up witches? Today I'm back with a very special video that I have been researching for a couple months now and it's kind of a tie-in to the videos that I recently did about druidry. This time of year, in many different flavors of paganism, including Norse and what's typically grouped under Celtic paganism, you'll often hear going into Halloween and through until midwinter a lot of talk about the thinning of the veil or how the veil is thin this time of year and I really wanted to do a video exploring what that means. So this video is going to be all about the concept known as the other world. So what do we mean when we say things like the thinning of the veil or that the veil is growing thin? Well, it means the veil between the worlds. So in a lot of Irish, Welsh, and Brythonic mythology, you will see this place which is commonly referred to as the other world or the land of fairy, and it's sometimes also tied in with concepts related to the land of the dead, which is interesting. But what is the other world? In my opinion, it's not exactly the same thing as the underworld, even though it can sometimes be described as being accessible through going under the hill. But the other world of this Irish and Welsh and British lore is more akin to a parallel realm or parallel dimension which overlaps and in some ways intertwines with our own. And as we get into this time of year, which in my video all about the wild hunt and things like that, I explored the concept of Samhain through midwinter being this very liminal time of year on the Celtic wheel or the wheel of the year where it's in between the old year and the new. And so it's this liminal space where that veil or the whatever is separating our world of Midgard or the human or mundane physical world from this other world inhabited by spirits, fae, fairies, and these otherworldly beings, it's why the veil is so thin during this time of year because it's already this very wibbly wobbly, timey wimey space and time. So it just makes it all that much more easier for us to pierce that veil and interact with those beings and vice versa. And that's why it's the time of year when the wild hunt is said to be riding about because it's the time of year when it's the easiest for them to cross that veil and enter our world. So the other world, especially within the myths and legends, is typically inhabited by these strange otherworldly beings who might in some cases appear to be human, but they are in fact more supernatural or typically what we would think of when we think of elves, fairies, fae, and elementals, or land spirits. And in the Irish lore, they were also known as the Tuatha Dé Danann, or the She. Now, these are not exactly the same from what I have found, and if you go look into things like the Irish Pagan School, or, oh, what is her name? Mara Starling, I believe? who is a um, native Welsh practitioner, and so they, th both of those channels have a lot of more in-depth information on these different types of beings and 
the differences in between them. So while I don't think that the she are the same exact beings as the Tuatha Day, we do know that in the Irish mythological cycle, after the coming of humans to Ireland, a lot of these Tuatha Day Danann did end up kind of shifting over into this other realm, also inhabited by the she. And I think over time, they kind of came to be conflated or mixed up together. But I think they're kind of two distinct types or classifications of being that might have some overlap in their their realms and their aspects. The word she is the same as the word for a mound or a especially like a burial mound which is where you will often find it most easy to come in contact with these types of beings and you'll often see those legends or stories and folk tales of humans who stray too close to the hill or into the fairy rings um, and end up crossing unawares into the other world or the realm of fairy and I think that the burial mounds are kind of a place where we can access those spaces because it represents kind of a boundary or a doorway crossing into and entering those types of mounds. It's a portal not just to the underworld or Helheim as we see in a lot of the Norse myths when people will go and perform Utiseta at the burial mounds to contact ancestors. And I think this is where we get a lot of mixing of these themes of the land of fairy with the land of the dead. In the Norse Smith, Freyr is said to be a king of Alfheim or the Alfar, but the Alfar is also a term for the male line of ancestors or ancestral spirits, which is interesting. The other world or the land of fairy, land of the dead, is also said to be in the direction of the west which is the direction of the setting sun, which could also be why it is often seen as a direction of travel into the other world. And it's also, and also why it's kind of referred to as names like the land of eternal youth, the summer lands, or the undying lands. Not because the people there, I mean, the Fae could be said to be these immortal beings, but as far as the human spirits that dwell there, they are spirits of those who have died. So it's not the undying lands in that sense, but once your spirit or your soul travels there, that's when you get to experience this eternal summer land, this land of eternal youth and peace. And an interesting note in Tolkien's mythology, as we see in the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings, the eternal realm of the elves and the Valar, or Valinor, is also in the west. And at the end of The Return of the King, that is where Frodo and Gandalf and the elves are departing for. Is And you kind of get this sense that it is almost like an afterlife in a sense, where they might not be dying necessarily, but they are departing for this undying land, this realm inhabited by the elves and these peaceful beings where you will no longer know sorrow or strife and things like that. I think that the concept of the other world is perhaps best known and featured in the Welsh tale of Pool Pen Anun. I'm going to try my very best to correctly pronounce these Welsh names and deities, so bear with me. And once again, I will refer you back to Mara Starling for proper pronunciations on things like that. And um, they have some great videos on working with the Fae and working with these Welsh deities and these concepts of the other world. But in the story of Pool, he is a mortal chieftain who one day is out hunting in the forest on his land. And we know that the woods or the wilderness and the boundary in between the human farmlands and the human civilizations and the untamed wilderness 
is also another type of liminal space where you can cross over into this land inhabited by the other. And so Poole is out hunting one day when he sees this pack of red and white hounds and they are chasing down a stag. Now, these are hounds of the other world by their coloring, these white hounds with red ears and red markings, but Poole either doesn't know this or he still just decides that, hey, he's on his land and so it's his right to go and pull these hounds off of the stag and try to claim the kill for his own. But since these are hounds of the other world, he may have unknowingly stepped between the veil through that liminal space between the mortal world and the other world because he is immediately confronted by Aron, the master of the hounds, and therefore, in some respects, a master of the wild hunt and a lord of the other world who demands that Poole make amends for this slight. For the wilderness is, by all rights, belonging to these beings of the other world who inhabit these woodlands. Aaron demands that Poole make amends for this slight. And using glamour magic or illusion, another ability which we often see attributed to the Fae or these other world beings, he switches places with Poole and gives Poole his appearance and Aaron takes on Poole's appearance. And he demands that for the classic mythological year and a day, they will have to switch places and rule each other's kingdoms. So, Aron is going to go rule in Dyfed or Pool's kingdom in the human lands, and Pool will have to rule over Aron's otherworldly kingdom. And not only that, it just so happens that while he's there during this year and a day, Aron has a standing appointment with a rival other world lord named Hafkin to meet him in combat one year hence. Now it is Poole who will have to fulfill that obligation in Aron's place and battle this lord. So this also kind of pulls in some very green knight themes here, but not only does Poole manage to defeat Hafgan after being told the method in which he can be slain, but he's also a real bro while he's there because Aron is married, but not only does Pool, while disguised as Aaron, not sleep with Aaron's wife, but he goes a step further and like basically will not even look at this woman for the entire year and a day that he is here, even though he probably could have gotten away with it and she would have been none the wiser thinking that she was just fulfilling her wifely duties and sleeping with her husband. But Poole, ever the gentleman, doesn't sleep with or even touch Aron's wife while he's there. And so during this time, both of their kingdoms prosper, and when they switch back at the end of the year and a day, Poole has proven himself a loyal friend of Aron by not only defeating his rival and restoring peace to Aron Aron's kingdom, but by also not crossing that boundary with Aron's wife. And so they kind of remain fast friends after this, and Pool earns the title Pool Penanwen, or Pool Penanun, or Pool Prince Pool Penanwen. Pool oh my gosh. These Welsh names are really killing me. He earns himself the title Pool Pen Anun, or Pool Prince of Anun, which is the Welsh name for the other one. So it's very interesting that in this tale, Poole does not explicitly seek out the other world or try to cross over, but just by stepping over that boundary in between the human lands and the civilized lands and the untamed wilderness, he steps over that boundary, that liminal space, and may have unknowingly stepped into the other world as a result. And so these Hounds of Anun or the Hounds of Aaron, the basically, um, if you want to think of it 
as like hellhounds, even though this is not the underworld. Um, so it's not hell per se, but they are these otherworldly hounds, which are also said to be seen during the riding of the Wild Hunt. And so Aron um, might also be said to contain aspects of that Karananos or that horned lord of the forest who rides with or leads the Wild Hunt, which is interesting. So, from some of these stories and fairy tales, it can be um, surprisingly easy for us foolish mortals to unknowingly cross over these boundaries and enter the other world, but by deliberately seeking out these types of liminal spaces, it becomes all that much easier to cross over the veil or pierce the veil and enter this other world. I guess to summarize this video, if I had to describe the other world, I would basically say it's almost like a parallel realm or dimension, which as I said is almost layered, uh, layered over our own. If you have things like the special sight, or sometimes it's said that by looking through um, the hole in a hagstone, you can also see pierce the veil and see into the other world or see things which you might not otherwise be able to on this plane with the naked eye. I guess the best way that I could kind of um, describe it would be as it's almost like a Venn diagram. We have Midgard and then to kind of use the Norse cosmology, layered over that above and below are Svartalfheim, which is inhabited by the Dark Elves or the Dwarves, and then it's also akin to this almost like atmospheric or airy realm layered above Midgard of the Light Elves or Ljosalfar, but in between those little circles of the Venn diagram where it overlaps. It, it overlaps in parts with Midgard or our own world, if that makes sense. So it's separate but not in a way. And the beings can still interact with this plane and we can interact with them and theirs. But at, during this time of year, when the veil between our world and the other world is at its thinnest, it's the easiest time to access and interact with those types of energies. So I hope that this video makes sense and was interesting and insightful for you. And I'm looking forward to exploring the concept further in videos where I will be delving into things like the nine known realms of Norse cosmology and also something that I'm looking forward to doing during the winter months here is I'd like to start a series called Fireside Fairy Tales where um, we'll play a little bit of dress up like this and I will sit next to the fireplace and regale you with some fairy tales which I find both fun and fascinating from a hidden goddess type of perspective because so much of what we know about these goddesses I think has been lost to time especially with the overtake of Christianity and more male patriarchal centered religions so I think that going back and delving into folk tales and fairy tales can be a great way to gain some insight on some lost beliefs and practices, especially where goddesses are concerned. So um, look forward to that coming up here soon, and until next time, stay classy, pagans.